we must stay true to the true doctrine of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That everything that happens in life is the will of God. That's why we pray your kingdom come, your will be done. You have a destiny with Jesus Christ. It's what Jesus accomplished at the cross for you. It's what he accomplished by the shedding of his blood. Well, hello everyone. I'm Pastor Mark Lee and, and I will be bringing you your message today. I'm going to be completing uh, a, uh, a series that I've been doing uh, through the book of 1 Timothy. And uh, last month when I, I shared a message on 1 Timothy chapter 3, uh, we dealt with the subject of, of what husband of one wife means, and, and I'm sure if you got to hear that message, there are some of you that said, praise the Lord, and there were some of you that disagreed with me wholeheartedly. Um, I would just uh, suggest to you that you seek out God, and then you go to God's Word, not go to your favorite commentary, not go to uh, the Internet, but that you would seek God's Word and you would stay inside God's Word to, to find the uh, clarification on that. Now today what we're going to do is we're going to complete uh, the qualifications of an elder. And we're going to see what this man is to look like. Uh, because this is very important for the local church. And, and last time I spoke, one of the things I talked about was the legalism in the church and the liberalism in the church. And... And last we or last month's message was kind of was designed to kind of hammer on the legal side or the legalistic side, the Pharisaic side of the church. But today we need to deal with with the liberal side of the church. I just saw in the news today that four more denominations have decided to come out and say that gay marriage is okay, and they've given their their clergy the the okay to marry. Um, uh, uh, homosexuals and and that it's okay for their clergy to be uh, openly gay and uh, folks that's that's heresy that's falsity that is uh, what God warned us through through the book of first Timothy about that people in the end times people will will be lovers of self and not lovers of the Word of God and that they will they will choose what their flesh wants over what God's Word proclaims and, and we're seeing that we're seeing that in every facet uh, of the world today, and it's something that we need to be on our guard uh, about. Uh, we can't be laxed in that. We can't be quiet in that. We don't have to be brutal. We don't have to, to uh, tongue lash anybody. We, de we do need to be loving and, and explain that, that um, quite frankly, it's not about what you want and what I want. It's, it matters what the creator of the universe and our Lord and Savior wants. And that we, as, as his creation, must submit our will to his will. And, and that we must seek him first and seek his desire for what our life is to look like, what our marriages are to look like, how we raise our children, how we are to act in our communities, how we're to act in our churches. And, and we're going to look at, at what, it, what a man of God is to look like inside the church. And because it's very important that we, we select godly leadership, that they are Christ-centered, that they are focused on listening to the Holy Spirit and focused on reading and studying God's Word and that they, they study God's Word in context, that they, they don't cherry-pick verses and pull things out just to fit their, um, their heart's desire. Okay? Uh, very dangerous, very dangerous when the church does that. So let me open with a word of prayer, and we're going to dive in today. Father God, Lord, we just come before you today. And Father, I praise you, I thank you that you are sovereign, that you are holy, that you are unchanging, and that your word does not change. Father, that we can look at it, we can study it, we can apply it to our lives and know that we are inside your will when we do so. Father, I just pray that uh, you be glorified through this message. Father, I pray that your spirit be upon me. Uh, fill me, Lord. I pray for all those folks at home that are uh, watching this, listening to this, that um, your spirit would be upon them, that uh, if there's any um, falsities or issues that they're dealing with, Father, that your word would, would point those out to them. And for those that are, are following your word, that this would just affirm what they're doing and, and how they're approaching life, Father just, again, that you be glorified. We would give this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, if you got your Bibles, we're going to be looking at, uh, again, the, the third chapter of 1 Timothy. And 
we're just going to read through the qualifications, and we're going to talk about the qualifications and, and, and try to get our minds around them and see, uh, make sure that, that the people that God or that, that we have in leadership are, are God qualified, that God has qualified them. Okay? And it goes, uh, chapter 3, verse 1 says, Here is a trustworthy saying. If anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, he desires a noble task. Now the overseer must be above reproach, the husband of but one wife, temperate, self-control, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, and not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him with proper respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the, into the devil's trap. Okay, we're just going to work through that again um, and, and just try to qualify some of these, these things. Um, uh, it says that an overseer uh, sets his heart on, on something uh, that's, that's important. That if he wants to be an overseer, that, that he needs to do it with a humble heart. You know, it's not a position of power. And if you, if you have a viewpoint that being a pastor, elder, deacon, overseer is a position of power, you've already fallen into Satan's trap. That was one of the things that Satan fell because God didn't place mankind under Satan's authority. Uh, Satan fell. And, and leaders, we can fall into that same trap. We can, we can think too highly of ourselves. We can think we're always right, and, and nobody else can be right if they don't agree with us. And quite frankly, pastors, elders, teachers, we can take ourselves way too serious. Um, we need to humble ourselves and stay in the Word of God. And if somebody doesn't agree with you, look at their ministry. Look at, at, at how God's moving in, in their lives and, and God's moving in their ministry. And if, if you disagree with them, that's a red flag. Um, Check into it. Study it. Uh, make sure that, that you're not off. But that can be very affirming as well. Uh, maybe, maybe you do check into it and you find out, man, they're way off base. And you see that taking place in their ministry and you see the pride that they have. An overseer must be a humble spirit, must be somebody that, that isn't after power. It's a noble task, according to verse 1. Now, an overseer must be above reproach. To be above reproach means that nobody can come to you with accusation, that whether believer or non-believer, that they can't come to you and, call, and, and have um, grounds to call you a scoundrel, have grounds to call you an adulterer, have grounds to call you a thief or a liar or a drunkard or all those things. To be above reproach means that, that the world that you live in they see you as a godly man. That they, they can look to you and go, that's a godly example. That's who God wants to, to be the leadership of his church. Godly men fully submitted to God and God's word and listening to the Holy Spirit, studying God's word, leading God's people to do just those things. You know, the Apostle Peter in the book of 1 first, uh, first Peter, 2 Peter, he talks about being, being a shepherd and being an under-shepherd and leading God's flock, not because you have to, um, but because you desire uh, the, the, the peace in the, in the body and, and that uh, the gospel go forward. So a, a pastor, elder, deacon needs to be above reproach. Now, we talked last week about the husband, or last month, about the husband of, of but one wife. And scripture, uh, from this scripture, we, we've, there's a lot of different definitions of what exactly that means. Uh, I told you last time that the, the most common one is that it's dealing with polygamy. I personally, I believe that it's dealing with the way that a man treats his wife. And uh, that, that when you look at a, a, an elder or pastor, you should be able to look at his relationship with his wife and you will know that that's how he's going to treat the church. Okay? Does he honor his wife? Does he cherish his wife? Does he elevate her? Does he lift her up? Does he care for her? Does he provide for her? An elder needs to be all those things to his own wife and to the body of Christ. 
And, and now, folks, that, that's a tall order. I can tell you as a pastor, that's a very tall order. And this list that I'm going to give you, not a, you're not going to get all A's on every one of these, but you shouldn't have any F's, okay? You should be growing in all of it, but you should be, um, you should be above the, the average in, in all of it as well. Okay, you should be temperate and self-controlled. Okay, that means you don't fly off the handle. That means you don't, uh, you don't get drug into uh, arguments that have no value. If we go back to the first chapter of 1 Timothy, we see that Paul warns Timothy about not getting caught up in genealogies and, and old wives' tales and, and things of that nature, that, that, we, um, that we control ourselves. One of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control. And, and uh, an elder, pastor, overseer, deacon, you should see self-control. You should see self-control with, with food. You should see self-control with alcohol, self-control with money, self-control with the opposite sex, uh, how you approach them, how you speak to them, um, crude jokes with, uh, with uh, women of the church is, is very un- inappropriate. Um, things of that nature. Uh, we need to be self-controlled, but we, we need to make sure that we, are, are, we have our tempers in order. Now, guys, all of us know that we have a temper. We, we have something that we have to keep in check. And we also know that when we lose our temper, we say things that we shouldn't say and, and we wish we could take back. An elder needs to have that in check. Okay? Very important. Need to be respectable. An elder needs to conduct himself in a way that, whether you like him or not, you respect him. You know, I used to do construction years ago, and I had a couple guys that I worked with that, quite frankly, I didn't like a whole lot. I didn't like their, their choices in life. I didn't like their, uh, their attitude on certain things and their humor. I didn't like their politics. But you know what? I could respect them because they would show up and do a whole day's work. And we could plug in, and as long as we left those areas alone... Um, we could get work accomplished. Uh, an elder should be somebody that is respectable. The way he, the, he will treat people the way he desires to be treated. An elder should not be known as somebody that treats others with disrespect. It's just that simple. Nowhere in Scripture will you ever find a passage that it's okay to treat anyone, even your enemy, with disrespect. It's important. You know, Scripture says that David was a man after God's own heart. And I would tell you that one of the reasons that he was that is because David always treated with respect. Now, that's not a a blank statement because we know that he he killed, had Uriah uh, killed. But but David uh, wouldn't speak against uh, Saul when Saul was trying to kill him. He wouldn't raise his hand against him. Okay, He he, he, he gave respect and he received respect. An elder should be uh, hospitable. Hospitable just means that you're, you're willing to help. You're willing to bring people into your home. You're willing to help people in need, uh, that you don't turn a blind eye to the plight of someone else, that, you're, um, that you bring them into your world. It is so easy in the world that we live in to, to see a problem, write a check, and go on with life. It's so easy in the world that we live in to say, oh, I'll let my wife take care of that. I'm guilty, Okay. I'm guilty of doing that. It's easy to do that, but to be hospitable means that you care for the needs that God brings in your way, in your path, on a daily basis. Might be that you have them home for supper, might be that you put them up for the night, but it just might be that you, uh, you embrace them as a human being and, and give them your time. Uh, Our time in the world that we live in is so calculated. It's so every minute we're supposed to be doing this thing or that thing. One of the greatest ways you can be hospitable is just giving someone of yourself. Okay? Let's keep going. Uh, uh, An elder, pastor, deacon must be able to teach. Now, Scripture says that we should be able to teach. and, And what that means doesn't mean that you have to be able to preach. Uh, it means that you be, need to be able to open the Word of God and you need to be able to teach someone what the Word of God is saying. You need to be able to apply what God is saying. Uh, simple process, uh, um, observe, explain, explain, apply. That's how I write my messages. I observe a passage, I explain a passage, we apply the passage. And, 
And it doesn't have to be any harder than that. Now, there are some great teachers out there, men that God has gifted, he's given them a hunger to dig through the verbiage of every line and every dot and tittle. I'm not one of those guys. Okay, I do enjoy studying scripture. I do enjoy God's word. But for an elder to be a teacher, he must be able to explain the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you can't explain the gospel of Jesus Christ, you have no business being uh, an overseer in Christ's church. So you need to be able to explain what it is to be saved. You need to be able to explain that Jesus Christ came, lived a perfect life. He, he went to a cross. He bore our sins on that cross. He was dead and buried, and three days later he rose again. He showed himself to over 500, and he ascended into heaven where he sits at the Father's right hand and acts as our high priest to explain that salvation is through Christ and Christ alone, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. To be able to explain what it means to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead so that you can be saved. We need to be able to explain those things and teach those things. The, the passage that he must be able to teach does not mean that he's got to be a, a, a doctor. It just, uh, it just means he needs to be able to explain God's word. Now, and then it says, verse 3, not given to drunkenness. Okay, now folks, again, this was written in the first century, um, uh, first century Christians, first century Jews and Gentiles, and, and um, not that that makes a huge difference because alcohol has been present then, it's present now. Um, this passage doesn't say that you cannot, it just says that you need to be very careful if you do. And, and that you're not given to drunkenness. Again, this is about being above reproach and that nobody can come and make the accusation that you're a drunkard. You need to be of sober mind and, and be able to handle God's word. You never know when God's going to bring someone into your, your pathway that needs to hear um, a truth uh, from the Holy Spirit. Well, in Ephesians it says, don't get drunk on wine, but, but on the Holy Spirit. And, and so, um, if you're going to, you need to be very careful. Uh, that's all I can say on that. Not violent, but gentle. Okay, um, men can destroy their own family with their own hand, with violence, okay? They can make their children and their wives scared to death of them because of a violent nature. But they can also make their children and their wives feel cherished and protected and cared for by a, a gentle spirit. And the same is true with God's church. If a, if a pastor, elder, overseer is, is always angry and is always unapproachable and comes across as a, as a violent man, like you're not sure that he, he won't fly off the handle, uh, that's not who God's called you to be. God has called you to be a, a, a man of peace and, and to be the broker of peace uh, in the church. Um, so uh, an elder or pastor overseer must be a man of peace. Uh, must not be a lover of money. Okay, you know, you, you, you don't focus on how much money's in your pocket, how much money's in your bank account, how much money you can earn on every, everything that you do every day. You can, you can put your, your focus so much on, on the world and what the world has to offer, that you're not a witness to the world, and you're not a, 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 a living testimony for the younger in the church to, to follow. And if, if you're an elder, and you're in love with money, you will teach those underneath you not to seek the Lord, but to seek the bank account. Okay? Very critical that, that you not be a lover of money. We all got to make money, we all got to survive, we all got to pay our bills, but we just... We're not, we don't be in love with it. Now, he must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him with proper respect. Okay. Last time I spoke, we dealt with the subject of divorce. And, and we dealt with, can a divorced man be in leadership? And the answer is yes, he can. Okay? Uh, especially if it happened before he came to Christ. He's a new creation in Christ. Okay? But... There's an argument to be made, even if he was a young man and, and he got saved and got divorced and enough time goes by. 
okay? But this passage says that he must manage his own family well. And for all of you that think that, that I was being liberal last time I spoke, you need to understand that if, if you're divorced, you, it needs to be a very long time before you ever serve in leadership in a church. You need to prove yourself uh, that, that your... Um, your past isn't going to cling to you, your past isn't going to drag you down, that you're not going to get caught up in focusing on all the things that, that took place in, 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 uh, in that failure. Because it was a failure. A marriage did end, and that, the, the failure is what the sin is. Okay? And you must, if you're going to manage God's church, you must be able to manage your own household. And so... That's saying that, that men need to be an example to the church of what a godly husband father looks like, and that should transfer to how a godly woman treats a godly man and a godly children treat a godly man. Okay, And, and so what you need to understand about the subject of divorce in this, this piece is... is you can't have a divorce and say, hey, I can manage my own family. I do a great job managing my family. You, you, you can't do that. Now, if someone is, gets divorced and, and uh, uh, gets remarried and they live their life for the Lord and 10, 20 years go by, and they've proven themselves to be all these things, that they got their house in order, then it's acceptable. It might not be the. He might not be your first choice, and maybe he shouldn't be your first choice because there will be so many people that can stumble over this issue. But to say that he can't is legalism. But to say that he can and he can jump in right away after divorce, quite frankly, that's liberal. That's being way too generous with with the leadership of the body. Men that lead God's church need to be Christ-centered, and they need to be Christ-centered for a while. Okay? I'm not going to give you a timeline. Um, I just know that, that it, it, if you have a major failure in your life, that um, um, you should, there should be a time of, of um, well, proving yourself uh, worthy of that office. Okay? None of us are ever going to be completely worthy, but again, you shouldn't get any Fs on this list. And a divorce is an F, quite frankly. Um, now, he must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited. Again, this kind of goes back to that same idea about somebody that's been divorced. It shouldn't happen quickly because it can lead to uh, conceit. It can puff us up. It can make us proud. It, it, it can think it's a position of power and that we want to be in charge of the church. And we'll straighten this church out if they just make me an elder. Folks, I got news for you. That's not how it works. Um, being a pastor elder is all about responsibility. It's all about accountability. Um, it's not about getting to lead and do the, everything that you want to do in a church, because quite frankly, that's just not how it works. Um, you're leading a, a, a flock, and they all have their own view and their own mindset, and they want to do things their way, and, and um, it's your job to lead them in a manner that brings them to obedience in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, that's it. You lead them in a way that, that leads them to obedience in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, but you don't make a, a, a recent convert an elder because he can fall. He can fall into the devil's trap and fall under the same judgment as the devil. Uh, verse 7 says he must also have a good reputation with outsiders. Okay, that means an elder should be above reproach in the world around him. We kind of talked about this in the beginning, but, but that the world, the people that he works with in a secular world, the people that sit next to him at his kids' ball games, the, the people at the gas station where he gets his gas, the people in the church most definitely, okay, but the people in the tax office and the people in the, the lawyer's office and, and, and all those areas should be able to look at that, that individual and say, He's a man of integrity. He's a man uh, with, uh, with a good reputation. He's an honorable man. He's a moral man. He's a just man. That's what it means. You know? and, and folks, I'm sorry, if, if you have major failures in your life, if you're out getting drunk, if you're out getting in fights, if you're a lover of money, if, if you're a recent divorce, you, you can't serve in the office. 
you can't serve in the office because the world's looking in and the church is looking in. And you're not a good example. You're not a good representation of what Christ is to be like. Okay? Again, we're all sinners. We're all fallen. We all fall, all fall short. But in this list, there's 15 different things that are listed here, and you can't get F's in any of them. If you get F's, you've got to step down or go or not be nominated. Okay? If you're a pastor and you fall into these, you need to step down. Okay, if, if you're a pastor and, and you can't manage your own house, okay, because you're spending all your time at the church, and this happens all the time, you spend all your time at the church and your, your wife uh, is disillusioned and, and she wants something different, your house isn't in order. And quite frankly, you need to step out of the ministry. You need to get your house in order first. You're a team. Your wife and you are a team. And, and, and so it's very important that that uh, you have a good reputation with the outside world. Um, they don't have to like every one of your viewpoints, but when you have a viewpoint that disagrees with them, how do you treat them? Do you treat them like a leper? Do you go to somebody, you know what, you're a homosexual, you're going to burn! Or do you tell them that, you know what, God loves you and so do I? You know, what's your heart? That's what they need to see. He must not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. Folks, I would tell you that these are qualifications are very similar for that of a deacon, and they kind of go hand in hand. Uh, the deacons oversee the physical needs of the church. The elders oversee the spiritual needs of the church. They're to pray together. They're to pray often. They're to work as a team. Uh, there's, it's not supposed to be us and them. Um, there's to be unity, and if there isn't unity, it's the elder's responsibility to make that happen. Okay? Um, it, it just is, because you're in the position of leadership. And, and so, again, I want you to understand that, that um, this passage deals with uh, a lot of things. It does deal with the subject of divorce. Uh, it speaks about you having your house in order and before you take that position. And, and so, folks, if, if you're coming off a divorce, you need to be, uh, and the church needs to be very slow to put you in that position, and you need not to get your, your feathers all ruffled because they haven't asked you, because there was a failure. Okay? Let's pray. Father God, Lord, we just come before you again, and, and Father, it is a difficult uh, uh, subject when you uh, bring divorce into it, but it's important for the church body to wrestle with and that we have a biblical view of it. And, um, Father, it's, that it's not a cannot, but it might be a should not. So uh, we just lay this before you. We, we recognize that we're fallen and, and that you love us, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. If you would like to buy a DVD of this program, please send $10 to KFXB-TV, 744 Main Street, Dubuque, Iowa, 52001. Please be sure to include the episode number on the screen.